Fantastic. Well, thank you, Toby, from the beach now. I yeah. love your background. Perfect. All right. So listen, today was is all going to be about um, shoulders assessment, right? Uh, and how I start thinking about shoulders. And this is kind of the basic uh, chat that I will have with my registrars who are joining a shoulder firm. Um, but what it does, it kind of simplifies um, from anybody looking after patients with shoulder problems in, in the elective setting on how to start thinking about it. Um, so you guys know who I am. Um, I, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, um, you know, I've covered a lot of sports teams, uh, the NBA, I was with the England 2015 uh, rugby as well. Um, and obviously, I have a combination of both uh, private practice and NHS. Uh, Royal London, which is most of you guys know, as you work in Tower Hamlets, is my home base. Um, although I've been a consultant there since 2012, um, I have been associated with the hospital, even though not this hospital, the old hospital, um, since uh, 2000, because I've been an SHO there, house officer there, a registrar there, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is home for me, um, um, very much so. Um, and going forward to things about today. So when I think about shoulders, um, the the key is to figure out when a patient is coming to your clinic on what do you think is going to be wrong with them, right? And when you have somebody who doesn't deal with shoulders all the time, that that concept of looking after shoulders can be a little bit uh, daunting, right? So shoulders and elbows is pretty much all I do, right? Yes, I have big trauma coming in, but it's, I only do shoulders and elbows. Um, so it's very easy for me, right? And even if, you, and for most physiotherapists, it becomes quite easy as well. Uh, but quite rightly, um, unless you are a GP with a special interest like Toby, you know, you guys have the ability to have patients with have diabetes and heart problems and look after a lot of different things, right? And to know everything about shoulders is pretty hard as well because there's plenty of things you need to know all about. So nobody's expecting expertise but what this does, it kind of gives you a little bit of a template on figuring out what you think the problem may be and whether you refer or you don't refer. So these are the A, B, C, Ds, and they're basically the age, the symptoms the patients present with, where the pain is, and some of the red flags that you need to look after. So age, right? Well, if you look at shoulder problems and the age of where the patients present, um, actually, it kind of makes it really, really easy, right? So in practice, if somebody walks into my clinic, right, and they have gray hair and they're in their 50s or 60s or 70s, I know that they're more likely to have a shoulder problem that is related to either arthritis or even more likely to have a problem related to, you know, rotator cuff pathology. Whereas if somebody who is in their late 40s or 50s is more likely to have impingement, frozen shoulders. Um, and of course, the more younger people tend to get injuries related to, uh, problems related to injuries, right? So if somebody who walks in who's 20 years old in your clinic has a shoulder problem, right, you can pretty much you know, bet on it that they have some kind of shoulder dislocations or instability kind of problem. So you always get a clue immediately if, you, if somebody comes to your clinic and has a shoulder problem by just knowing the age. And it has, has a lot of weight put onto it, right? So although there is overlap, and yes, young people can have major trauma and they can tear their cuffs to bits, or they can have major injuries that can eventually have post-traumatic arthritis. Or you can have somebody who's really old and starts getting instability. But generally speaking, the rules are that the younger people have problems with trauma, which results in shoulder instability, including glenohumeral joint and ACJ instability. They may have problems of internal impingement and so on, which is again um, related to capsule labor structures. Whereas when you start getting slightly older, you start getting problems like frozen shoulders or impingement or impingement yet. And as you get older, and as you get much older, as you get much older, you start getting, start getting degenerative changes like full thickness tears and arthritis. Um, um, 
age now, right? So age is done. Now we're talking about other symptoms. So what do people normally present with? So can, can somebody just give me one symptom that you will commonly see in a patient with shoulder problems? Pain radiating down the arm. Yeah, so pain is, of course, uh, the main common symptoms that patients present with, right? And that's, that, that is predominantly the symptoms that people will seek advice for, okay? But of course, there are other things as well. Some of them may complain that my shoulder is really, really stiff. Others may complain that my shoulder is unstable. Believe it or not, there are people that have overlaps between stiffness and instability, right? But generally speaking, those two are slightly separate, right? You can have somebody with a frozen shoulder who says, I have pain and I have stiffness, right? Um, and there is a fourth um, kind of problem as well, which is essentially weakness as well. Now, those are the four main symptoms that patients present with, generally speaking, any musculoskeletal condition. Pain, stiffness, instability, and weakness. And as a habit, um, we ask the patients open-ended questions on what they come in for, but we do ask very specific questions as well to say, yes, you have pain, but you have a feeling that your shoulder is too stiff or you have a feeling that your shoulder may dislocate. Just ask probing questions because sometimes in the history, the patients may not obviously volunteer the secondary symptoms. Uh, weakness is something that they commonly forget, right? Because you know, who comes to the GP and says, my shoulder feels slightly weak, right? They usually come and say it hurts, but they may have weakness as well. Um, of course, the, the, what you mentioned about pain radiating down or neurological symptoms, those are all, also symptoms. So pins and needles so is, is, is an additional yeah. symptoms that you may get. But as far as the main four symptoms are, is pain, stiffness, instability, and weakness. So you ask your age, you ask the shoulder symptoms, and then you know that the uh, the pain is the main reason why patients come and see you, right? But, you know, but what is shoulder pain, right? And how do you figure out where this pain is coming from? Well, quite interestingly speaking, um, quite a bit of the shoulder pain tends to be kind of nonspecific, except when you get pain from your ACJ. So as you may know, the shoulder is not just one joint, it has uh, five different joints. Um, and one of the joints right on the top of the shoulder is the ACJ. So here's a model of the shoulder, right? And that joint right on top is the ACJ, the acromioclavicular joint. And when you get pain there, actually it tends to be pretty localized, right? So, and feeling that joint on top is also quite painful. So if somebody comes up to you and says, my pain is on top of the shoulder, you can hang your hat on it. That is very likely to be a CJ. Um, but what about, what about normal shoulder pain? What about cuff pain? What about other pain? Of course, you know, patients who are unstable may not have any pain at all. But when people do have shoulder pain, in inverted commas, uh, the distribution doesn't seem to be very, very precise and localized as ACJ pain is. Um, the reason is that shoulder has a lot of different nerve endings from the axillary nerve, the suprascapular nerve. And when you get pain from a shoulder pathology, it gets referred to the side of your arm or your anterolateral aspect of your arm, which is the third kind of figure down, right? And the fourth figure down. So, you know, so when you have pain on the side of the arm, where some people might think is coming from your deltoid, it's not actually, I think most shoulder pathology uh, distributes pain there. What is interesting is, as you know, that you can have referred pain from your cervical spine as well, right? And a lot of people get neck-related pain referring to the shoulder and vice versa. Now, if somebody comes to you and has what they call inverted commas shoulder pain, but the pain is actually what the second figure shows, mostly in the back near the scapulothoracic area, or any kind of symptoms of pain going beyond the elbow, you got to start thinking about cervical spine as well, right? Now, these are, you know, generic rules. Of course, cervical spine can present with pins and needles and numbness, but any pain in the back of the shoulder, scapulothoracic area, or going beyond the elbow, some think about the neck, 
anterolateral shoulder pain is essentially most shoulder pain. And ACJ is very, very specific to the top of the shoulder. So far, guys, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Perfect. So moving on to the next bit. Red flags, right? Now, for those of you who um, don't know, this is a cut and paste from a British Elbow and Shoulder Society and British Orthopedic Association guidelines, right? So these guidelines were specifically devised for, for GPs as well as primary, secondary and tertiary care. Uh, and these are kind of generic guidelines on lots of different um, pathologies in the shoulder and elbow. So there's one for arthritis, there's one for impingement, there's one for uh, shoulder instability. Um, I was a lead author on atraumatic shoulder instability. But what they do is they take different experts from different areas in the shoulder and elbow world. And we, we sit down with a few shoulder surgeons. We sit down with the physios experts in this area and we produce these guidelines. Um, some of you may be aware of this, uh, but these are freely available and they come <clears throat> as nice little PDFs that kind of, you can have the box charts as well, where you can say, follow the journey of the patient. And, and these are good ones for uh, GPs and trainees, as well as physios to have an indication of um, how to manage different conditions in the shoulder based on the most current evidence but written in really, really simple language that uh, everybody can understand. In those, there are always these red flags and they tend to be very, very similar among all these different things. So what are red flags, right? And these, these, these link in with when you think that you should refer as well, right? So one of the things to bear in mind, which is the most common thing here is trauma, right? Right. So if anybody has any fall or whatever it is, irrespective of their age and so on, I think you are obliged to investigate it further. Okay. So if somebody's had a fall, please get an x-ray done because, you know, what you don't want to be doing is missing a fracture. Now, scenario is that somebody comes to your clinic and says, uh, my shoulder hurts and it's been slowly getting worse and so on uh, and they don't have any of these red flags uh, no trauma there's no swelling there's no skin changes like suggestive infection uh, they haven't had a fit etc then you can be a little bit more relaxed about it right you can do your normal pathways to say okay let's send you to a physio let's see what happens to the investigation right? but no matter how good you are assessing shoulders if somebody's had a trauma you just don't know whether you, there is an injury or not, right? So don't get me wrong. If somebody's fallen over and has a significant injury, like a fracture and something like that, which is obviously out of place, they're not going to come to you, right? They're going to go straight to A&E and they're going to sort that out. But it is the in-between us that fall over and have a subtle fracture where they didn't think much of it, um, or... There is a 50-year-old, 60-year-old fallen over and now can't move their arm and they ripped their uh, rotated a cuff. You're, you're obliged to investigate it a bit further. So trauma is one of the things that, um, in my opinion, automatically means that um, just have a closer look, make sure that they haven't broken or torn something. The rest of them are obvious, right? Any swellings or mass is a red flag. Um, any skin colorations, fever, uh, temperature changes are a sign of infection is a red flag. And obviously, if anybody's had an electric shock, trauma, epileptic fit, then it's very, very easy to have a missed uh, posterior dislocation and not even know about it. So again, in imaging, something like that will sort the problem out. One of the questions that people often ask is, okay, Ali, I get it. Somebody's come in with an injury done yesterday and... I can take it seriously and send them for an x-ray now, or if I can't, I'll send them to A&E. Um, but what if somebody's had an injury two weeks ago, right? And now they're coming to you with trauma. How soon should you get an x-ray? The, the right answer is, of course, as soon as possible. But being living in the real world, um, a ballpark figure is that, you know, if somebody's had an injury two weeks ago, you can probably wait at least half that time 
to get the another x-ray, right? So if you got injured done two weeks ago, if you waited for another week, if you had to, that would be okay, right? It's unlikely that they'll do significantly more harm if they haven't done it in two weeks already. Um, and if somebody's had an injury three months ago, yeah, they can probably go in your routine reasons for investigation and getting x-rays done to make sure they haven't done that. But if somebody has an injury a few hours ago or a few days ago and they end up coming to you, um, then please do get imaging uh, sooner. So what imaging do we get, right? Believe it or not, the x-ray is the best thing, right? Because it tells you if the alignment is normal. If the alignment is normal, usually you haven't got a major injury like a cuff thing or a dislocation. It also tells you whether there are fractures or not, right? So as orthopedic surgeons, we pretty much x-ray everybody. Now, there are other things you can do, ultrasound, MRI scans, and CTs, and the uh, questions I often ask here is in primary care, is there a role or not? Um, I have my views on it. I think the role for an ultrasound scan is very limited. So is an MRI is very limited. And I don't think there's a role for CT scan in primary care. Now, the reason I say is limited is that you can't rely on an ultrasound scan or an MRI scan to give your diagnosis. If you, if, you, if you don't know what's going on in a shoulder and you get an ultrasound scan and an MRI scan to figure out what's going on, it's quite often that you will get it wrong. Okay, and there are two reasons for it. Firstly, and lots of studies have shown this, there's no such thing as a normal MRI scan or a normal ultrasound scan. You scan 100 people, 99% of them will have a cut and paste saying there's a little bit of impingement in the bursitis. Because you know what? It's, it's common to see that and say it in a scan anyway. Um, and and this, is, this is human nature, right? They scan a patient, they know the patient is coming because of a shoulder problem, and they will say it. But people have gone out there and studied normal shoulders and scanned normal shoulders, and, and the normal shoulders which have no symptoms get reported with impingement and bursitis as well. And same thing with the MRI scan. There's no such thing as a normal MRI scan. So if I see a professional rugby player, there's probably a hundred percent chance that they have a labor tear and they don't even care about it, right? If I see a, anybody who's done an ounce of work and they're over the age of 40, they will have ACG arthritis, normal people, right? So just because an MRI scan says they have an ACG arthritis, doesn't mean it's symptomatic, no. But you would know because if you just use simple questions by asking where the pain is, I top the shoulder um, and, and had a brief uh, chat with them from the history and examination and they alluded, you probably know that they have ACJ pain. And if you ask that question, then maybe the scan will uh, show something. But you can't rely on an MRI scan confirming the diagnosis because there are lots of normal findings um, in an MRI scan that are not causing a problem. Similarly, rotator cuffs are very, very common, right? So there's a common scenario in Tamar Hamlets that there's a lot of diabetes and specifically there is relatively uncontrolled diabetes, unfortunately, despite all our efforts. Um, and we see a lot of patients presenting with a condition that is related to diabetes, i.e. frozen shoulders. So for, if you to have a stiff shoulder due to adhesive capsulitis, you're five times as likely to get it um, if you have uh, diabetes. Um, so what will an MRI scan show? Well, you could go and do an MRI scan, and if you're lucky, it may show some changes, inflammatory changes uh, in the capsule. You have to be very lucky. Right? But because you, an MRI scan is a non-dynamic scan, scan, it may just look normal for a frozen shoulder who has a really stiff shoulder. At the same time, if that same patient who has a stiff frozen shoulder has an asymptomatic cuff tear and is get picked up by an MRI scan, suddenly you have a patient that has been reported as having a cuff tear when the problem is frozen shoulder. How do you figure out whether the frozen shoulder is a problem or not? Well, it's very easy. Right, you know how old they are, so you know that a 50 year old is very likely to get a frozen shoulder for the 40 to 50 year old. You know that the pain distribution will be along the side of the arm, and there are no red flags like trauma, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you're narrowing it down. And the last bit is examination, you know, which we haven't touched upon because 
you know, we expect the physios and obviously the orthopedic surgeons to examine the shoulders well. Um, but from a GP point of view, right, the real gold dust of an examination is actually loss of passive external rotation, right? So if you are not able to do this, i.e. rotate outwards uh, externally, that means you either have a motor dysfunction, i.e. your muscles are not working, right? So you can see if you can push the shoulder out, arm out, right? And if, even then you can't do it, i.e. they truly have passive resistance to this, then they have a stiff shoulder, right? And there are really only kind of three reasons why somebody will have a stiff shoulder. There are many, but the main three main ones are that you are a, a young person who's dislocated their shoulder posteriorly, you are a really old person who has arthritis, okay? Or you are a middle-aged person who has the frozen shoulder. An, an X-ray will help you with that. So, so my view on this, uh, you know, we, uh, there has been a, some change in getting less and less MRI scans now, right? We all know that, you know, five years ago, you know, the first thing would be do an MRI scan, right? Um, but for us, it's not as helpful as you guys might think, right? Uh, so we rather um, have a patient that has a, a, the GP has worked out, the physio has worked out that, you know what, uh, this may be a degenerative condition, let's rehab him because there's no evidence of trauma and so on. And um, if it doesn't work, then maybe we'll investigate it and send it on. Uh, so that's basically me done. Um, my Toby, please, um, you, can, you, can, you can tweet me, of course, but um, Toby can share my um, telephone number with you guys. I'm happy for physios and GPs to contact me uh, for any of your patients, especially the NHS ones locally in Tower Hamlet um, that you have trouble with, right? Because I know for a fact how difficult it is to get them anywhere into hospitals right now because I do the triaging for uh, shoulders and elbows for um, um, at Bart's Health um, between the three sites. Uh, and, you know, the, the last time I did it, I went through about 300 patients that have been referred since during lockdown. And literally everybody apart from two of them needed to be seen in our clinics. So we know that it is going to take us many, many months and years to actually go through the backlog, right? Um, but there are lots of different ways that we can help you manage these patients in the community if you're stuck. So my NHS email, my telephone number, et cetera, we are available. And the least that we can do for you is help you sensibly triage if you are stuck, right? And we can figure out when some problems are really, really urgent. And if they are, we will facilitate those patients to be seen in our clinics. Um, and those who are can wait, we will say maybe they can wait. That's me done, guys. Um, I'll open it up to questions. Great, thanks, Ali. Um, any questions, anyone, please shoot straight away. Hi, can I ask a question um, about the x-ray investigation? Because um, I, I, I guess maybe just a GP thing, just always think of just x-rays for um, excluding fractures. But it's kind of useful. You mentioned that because of the way it shows the alignment, it can also be used to kind of identify if someone's sort of injured their rotator cuff. Is that right? Just to check. So, so if you have a big rotator cuff injury, then you may see a high riding humerus and so on in an x-ray. Um, you won't see most rotator cuff tears on an x-ray because x-rays will look normal. Uh, but in the context of shoulders, with the, with, with, apart from fractures, what x-rays are really good at is telling you if there's arthritis or not. A normal x-ray is very useful in frozen shoulders, adhesive capsulitis, i.e. with stiff shoulders to make sure that normal, if you have a normal shoulder x-ray, um, in a frozen, sh in, a, in a stiff shoulder, then you know it's adhesive capsulitis rather than arthritis or dislocations. Which brings it to the last point is that in addition to fractures, X-rays are very, very uh, good at showing subluxations and missed dislocations. 
and an anterior dislocation is 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 quite obvious. They had a lot more pain, um, and and you have the squaring off the side of the shoulder. But when the shoulders dislocate posteriorly, um, and they're especially dangerous because sometimes you may have a fit and so on, so the patient may not be conscious when they've dislocated their shoulder. And the reason they dislocate posteriorly is because our anterior muscles are so much bigger, more powerful than our posterior muscles. So the force coupling pushes it backwards. And, and they dislocate posteriorly, you may not see an obvious change in the contour of the shoulders, but they will still have a very locked, they are a locked internal rotation. So you can't actually move the shoulder out. So it can present like a stiffness. So an X-ray will show you that, if it's out or not. Is that yeah, answer your good. question, Mina? Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful because, um, as you said, often when if you want to get something emergency, you've got a patient who has had, for example, trauma and doesn't seem to be able to, the classic is like, it looks like rotator cuff, you know, they can't lift it up. I always sort of thought, oh, we need an ultrasound, but actually it's useful to know that you can just. Yeah, so for those ones, if you can get an MRI scan quickly enough, yes, it'll show you everything. But the ideal probably is an X-ray. Make sure that you haven't got anything urgent that you need to deal with right so mm -hmm. dislocations um and fractures are really 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 urgent right so an x-ray can be done quickly enough and you can sort that out but then you can get an ultrasound scan weeks later yeah. to make sure the cuff is intact because to be honest if you have a cuff tone even a traumatic nature it can wait a little bit because it's not like a fracture where it heal in the wrong place or a dislocation where you'll do joint damage Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Ali, on that note, how quickly do you recommend seeing um, acute rotator cuff tears? So, you know, full fitness, full width, supraspinatus tear, because obviously there's big delays if we refer. Yeah. So if somebody has, if somebody has had trauma and you think they have a rotator cuff tear, it should be treated like any trauma. It means to be sorted out pretty quickly. So you should be seeing them pretty quickly and you should be referring them on for imaging pretty quickly. Um, and so on. So look, what's the ideal scenario? Ideal scenario is an unrealistic scenario, right? So yeah. ideal scenario is that somebody's fallen over. So if, if any of you, right, fall over tomorrow and you suspect that you have a rotator cuff tear, what will I do? I'll bring you in, I'll do an X-ray, I'll do an ultrasound or MRI scan immediately. And I'll tell you whether you have a cuff tone or not. If you don't have a cuff tone, at least you know your diagnosis, whatever it is. And we'll rehab you if it's not torn. If it's torn, traumatic nature in a youngish person, we'll fix it quickly and we'll rehab you. That's the gold standard that we should be aiming for with rotor to cuff tears because that's how people do it well. You know, even in America, if you fix a rotor to cuff at four months, you're doing it late. Um, but that's not realistic, right? But what is also not realistic is wait for two years that we often tend to see, oh, I did my injury two years ago. So for cuff tears, you've got to, with trauma, you've got to take them a little bit more seriously, investigate quickly. And if they have an injury, then refer them on for fixation. Okay. Traumatic cuff tears are a different beast to um, the degenerative tears. Yeah. Can I just ask from a practical perspective, though, how we go about doing that? Do we ask them, do we send them with a letter to urgent care? Or um, because if we refer them for imaging or apart from an x-ray there's going to be quite a long wait and even if we refer them to orthopedics as well just what's, what's your wait time locally for an x-ray information for an x-ray for an urgent one they can walk in but for routine there's no routine uh, x-rays at the minute and there's no correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think there's any the ultrasounds are all being screened as well i don't think there's um the, yeah. ultrasound in normal way. times you're looking at say three four weeks um so if you can get a routine x-ray um and they know that there is no fracture, then waiting for a three to four weeks for a ultrasound in the community for a query rotator cuff is okay, right? Um, uh, but that's routine times, right? Um, so, you know, look, I mean, during these times, everything is out, I don't know. Yeah, hopefully things will get back to routine, but uh, if you to talk about routine, I mean, that's what we would do. We would, we would want, patients to get an x-ray to make sure they rule out an immediate dislocation or a fracture and then get an ultrasound scan in three or four weeks time if you're really worried just call us up <laughs> we'll fit them in the clinic thank you can i just ask a question um as well not to make it a personal consultation 
but I may have had a rotator. Um, I may have had a rotator cuff injury um, in October, yes. and was and was was referred for an MRI, which wasn't booked um, for whatever reasons. So it's booked for February, for example. So would if there was something that does come up on that, would that be kind of past anything that was a repairable, or is that still within the realms of okay, it's late, but actually no, if something things can't can be fixed delayed things can be fixed delayed as well and what we have proven to the world is thanks to tower hamlets and most of uk is that you can actually fix these things years down the line and they still do okay uh, but the rehab is slower and not all of them do okay because of the delayed thing are you are you still in pain and you still have trouble with your shoulder yeah so um yes. the pain That's is easy. kind of yeah the pain is definitely still still there quite Remy, problematic Remy, what we'll do is uh, have a chat with uh, toby and we'll walk you through on getting you into our clinic and get you seen right because if you if you can't function properly from this and then um, then you can't do your job properly either right so yeah, uh, we, that's we, helpful. We, we, I can't lift my child up properly because it's actually the pain still there. Yeah. But, but yeah, that would be... If it needs helpful. fixing, then it has to wait in the current climate. But if, mm. if you haven't got a tear and you just develop a secondary frozen shoulder or you have tendinopathy and so on, then we can we can see you, we can scan you, and we can inject you if, if, if it is suitable um, uh, pretty quickly. The problem is if you have cuff tear, then we don't inject, as you know, because it makes things worse in the long term, we think. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We had a quick question about uh, steroid injections, if that's all right. Um, sure. In terms of what are the, what during the pandemic times, what are the actual, uh, what's the guidance or advice that you have in terms of kind of providing steroid injections for kind of shoulder issues, frozen shoulders, et cetera, et cetera? So initially, as you know, that there was, we all know, there was a whole thing about COVID and immunosuppression with COVID with instruction with uh, steroid injections. So we stopped doing a lot of them. Um, subsequently, you know, figured out that it's your own immune system that messes you up. So something like dexamethasone is actually quite helpful. So what people are doing is they're still mentioning is COVID time. We don't know what the reality is um, that um, steroid injections uh, should be done, in my opinion, for shoulders and elbow conditions where they are appropriate. Um, and uh, so we're not, we're, we should be doing them and not be too concerned about the COVID itself, right? Um, um, however, the second question is who gets uh, steroid injections and who doesn't, right? So um, the, there are lots of unnecessary steroid injections and there are lots of conditions that steroid injections probably should not be used for. So it's a topic for another day, but tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, and steroid injections are really bad news, yeah? Okay? And the evidence on that is massive, right? Doing nothing is significantly better, right? So if you have tennis elbow and you follow up patients in big randomized controlled trials and you follow them up for one year, only 9% of them are in pain at the end of the year. If you do physio, PRP, and so on, you still have the same percentage, but they get there faster, i.e. they rehab faster, and they're less symptomatic. If you give them steroids, they all feel great at three months, but by the time you follow them back for one year, 50% are back in pain again. So overall, in the long term, steroids make things like tennis elbow and golfer's elbow much, much worse than not doing anything at all. But, but as human beings, as our and treating patients, you know, our, you know, there are positive feedback from the anti-inflammatory response rather than the is so huge that we feel grateful when patients come and say, "Doc, the injection worked great. Can I have another one?" Right? But every time in a tennis elbow, where technically it's an injury, all you're doing is reducing the inflammation but you're not healing anything. In fact, you're making things worse because steroids go against it. That's tennis elbow. And in shoulders wise, a lot bigger space and so on. So there's a little bit uh, different view on it, right? So for example, if we have ACG arthritis, a very close joint, and we know that if it's degenerative, if, if conservative treatment doesn't work, then you're going to shave that joint and make the space bigger, right? So you have nothing to lose by putting steroid injections in. 
Um, if you have a frozen shoulder, then doing a hydrodilatation, which has a little bit of steroid injections to help with the inflammation, fantastic thing to do, right? If you have subacromial impingement um, and you inject steroids in an intact rotator cuff around tendinopathic rotator cuff, which is okay with steroid injections, right? You will get some pain relief, but you got to do your physio afterwards because you got to count on the fact that the pain is relieved temporarily and impingement, uh, whatever the mechanism is, is usually a rehab solution and control the pain with steroids and then rehab the patient out of it. Otherwise you get a high chance of recurrence. Um, when it comes to traumatic mechanical problems like um, rotator cuff tears, right? Uh, biceps instability, anything that is broken or out of place, steroids will still give you pain relief, but will usually make matters worse. So if a cuff is torn, then there's no point giving a steroid injection. Unless you think there's a 90 year old is not fit for a haircut, then you can carry on giving steroid injections. Uh, but you know, most sensible people, um, most people, whatever the age is, you know, will benefit from rehab to sort their cuff out or may require surgery, but avoidance of steroid injections is good. So to answer your question in a summary way, I don't see an issue with um, coronavirus and giving steroids where is appropriate, right? I see um, the same old problem with MSK, using steroids for the correct pathology and not using them for the incorrect pathology. Thank you, that was really helpful. Perfect. Great. It's recorded, you can watch it again. <laughs> Perfect, any other questions? I know we've hit three o'clock. I'm sure you, everyone's got other meetings to go to and clinics. Sure, guys. Look, guys, it was, it was really good to meet you. Um, and um, like I said, this is this is the first one. Toby will do Zoom next time if possible. It yeah. works with my computer. <laughs> All right, but uh, but um, I'm happy to work with you, Toby, to see what different topics there are. We have lots of spine guys, lots of different knee guys, and so on. So, um, and and if you want to do it together with physio, is great. If you want to split it absolutely fine you know we can make the gp talks a bit more about referral pathways and, and so on and we can make the physio talks a bit more technical uh if you want to mix it all together happy with that as well but I'll, we'll be guided by, by you thank you thank you very much yep. um, yeah everyone right, thank you can i just say it's one of thank the you. probably one of the thank best you. most concise shoulder talks i've been to so yeah thank you uh, that's, that's great to know thank you Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, Tony.